go. We are recording. All right, a few things. Uh, some of you, or all of you, should have received announcements from me. Um, so hopefully you have read the syllabus and also watched the syllabus video so that you kind of have a general understanding of my expectations in this class, you know, re especially regarding like your know, disruptions and whatnot. Um, but also, you know, what I, how I grade and you know, what type of activities you, know, you need to do in order to get your grade, okay? And what score is an A, what score is a B, and so on. So all of that is in the syllabus. Do we have any questions about the syllabus itself? Nope, okay, all right. So <clears throat> just like with my, uh, so if you're also in my CISP, uh, 310 class, I do ap apologize that there will be a little bit of overlap because I talked about some of that stuff too in CISP 310. Um, I think I just want to do one more adjustment here. Oh, All right, so getting down to you know the course shell, the CISP 440 course shell. Uh, these are common to all of my classes, so if you are in 310 this morning earlier, this is going to be a repetition, okay, so there's nothing new here. Uh, time budgeting and management, this is a module that I wrote just a few days ago, because I realized that a lot of times, you know, people ask for extension or, you know, I cannot make it to the due date. Um, I don't have a problem when there are absolutely, you know, Basically, things that are completely out of your control, it just happens and it impacts you know, how much time you have available. But overall speaking, you know, knowing how to budget your time and how to manage your time is super important. Okay, I have ADHD, so I struggle a lot with this as well. So that's why I understand the importance. The first one is time budgeting. This class is easy to calculate because it's a three unit class. One unit is basically 18 lecture hours, you know, you know, in a semester. So three units is 54 lecture hours. So generally speaking, you can just think that, okay, I'm gonna spend 54 hours this semester in this room for this class. For each hour that you spend in a lecture, you're expected to spend two additional hours to study, to do your homework, to review your notes, to revise your notes, and so on. Okay, so you gotta have that budgeted in, in your, you know, when you're scheduling for classes. And that is on top of all the other things that you need to do, okay? You might have family obligations, uh, you might have a part-time job or even a full-time job. So when everything are added together, you have to make sure they all fit comfortably within the amount of time that you have, okay? Because you don't want it to be cutting really close or, you know, you don't have enough time. <clears throat> Do we have any questions about budgeting? Okay, so let's do some calculations. <laughs> 54 hours just in the class itself, plus how many more hours you know, that is outside of the class time that you, need, that you are supposed to be budgeting for? 108, very good. So over the, over the entire semester, you're supposed to be spending how many hours just for CISP 440 alone? No, 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 you guys, okay. This is why we have a pre-calculus, you know, prerequisite to this class, just to make sure you guys can get this math done. Okay, so we have 54 actual in class, okay, in cyberspace, plus 108, so when you add these two up, you're supposed to be spending 162 hours in this semester just for this class alone. Now, this is a full semester class, so you divide it by 16, so that gives you about 10 hours per week. Is that okay? And this is a typical formula for any three unit lecture only class. So using this formula, if you are taking four classes, that's 40 hours already, which is a full-time job. If you're taking five classes, which is you know, considered a full load, that's like 50 hours a week just for your classes, not counting anything else. 
So this is time budgeting. Okay, it is really important because you know if you did not budget enough time. Okay, if somebody does not budget enough time, and you know it's not going to show up at the beginning of the semester. It's going to show up at what week eight, week ten or so. What do you think is going to happen? I don't have enough time to do everything that I need to do. So what what do you think that you what is the emotion that's gonna kind of bubble up? Hmm? Get an F. Okay, that's a consequence. Yeah, but what is the emotion? What what is the stress, anxiety, panic? Right? Is any of that going to help you understand the material, especially the material of a class like this? Where it can be abstract, it can be complex, it can take a little bit of thinking on your part just to absorb the material. The answer is no. <laughs> okay, you know all of those emotions work against you know your know, understanding the material, because you know. Okay, this is you know, basically just you know how your brain is structured. In a fight or flight mode, okay, do you think? Okay, I'll give you a scenario. You are out there, out in the plane, okay, and you're being approached by some predators, like a, a pride of lions, okay, and they approach you, okay. So, do you think it's beneficial if your body just goes like, "I'm gonna pump you full of your know, stress hormone, so I can run faster <laughs> and have better eyesight and just being able being able to do everything better," or do you think it's gonna be helpful if you can just kind of use your monkey brain? To think about this this entire entire scenario is like, well, there are seventeen lions and there are four of us, so each person has to take on four lions and a little bit more. I see that lion is a little bit you know injured already, so I can we can we can discount that one. Do you think that type of rational thinking is going to help you? No. So basically, the innermost part of your nervous system will override your cognitive system. It's like don't think. Just run, not just run, but run like beep. Okay. So that means what? Anxiety is not going to help you understand materials in the class. So that's why budgeting is important because you don't want to run out of time. Okay.、Um, it also talks about your know, time management. Structure is good. So in this case, you know, we have an in-person class, which means there's an intrinsic structure to this class. It's not a 100% online asynchronous class where you can think, "I can do this any time I want," and then two weeks later you go like, "I don't even remember taking this class," because if I were to take an online class, especially fully asynchronous, that's what would happen to me. I cannot. Take online asynchronous classes. I know that. Okay, some of you are much more disciplined than I am, and you can do that. But I simply cannot. So time management has a lot to do with structure. So basically, with a class like this, you can go like, okay, the two extra hours that I'm supposed to spend, I'm going to spend one hour right before this class. I'm going to form a little study group. We'll go to the library. We'll study a little bit before coming to class. The other one is right after. We'll go back to the library and then do another session. You know, kind of review what is introduced in class, do our homework, and that makes it kind of structured. So every Monday, every Wednesday, at this time, we're going to do a certain thing about this class. Okay, that is going to be helpful, especially for people with with ADHD. That is super helpful.、Um, and you know, being able to come up with a list of things that you need to do. You know, kind of like a checklist is also important because I cannot possibly keep track of all the things that I need to do, and I often forget a few other, a few of those things. You can, I, I cannot remember how many times I have missed my own performance review meeting. I'm not kidding you, okay? And that's before I got tenure, and that's why I go like, okay, I cannot do it like this, okay? I need something to help me track what I need to do, okay? So you guys all have smartphones, right? You know, so your calendar, you know, the, the Google Calendar is capable of tracking tasks as well.、Um, the simplest way is just to use a piece of paper. Check it yourself every single day, 
and go like, okay, what do I need to do today? What homework is due? And so on and so forth. So this way you can kind of evaluate what you need to do in the shorter term. So we have, okay, let me go back to this part here. This is logistics. This is strategic, and this part here is technical. You need all three in order to be successful you know, in the college. Okay. You guys are graduating, I know. You guys are graduating very soon, okay? But this is also what you need at a four-year university, more so than it is here. Because here, some of the classes you go like, oh, even though I'm supposed to spend two extra hours on this you know, GE class, I spend half an hour and I seem to be getting by, okay? I can almost guarantee you that this 440 is not one of those classes. And this is the baby version of the you know, other classes, the upper division classes at a four-year university. So I just want to kind of give you the sense of scale. Is that okay? I hope I'm not you know, scaring anyone because I don't want you to be anxious now. You can be anxious after you transfer. <laughs> Are we good so far? How many of you are thinking, you know, maybe I should think about this, maybe I should worry about this? Well, I can tell you, if you're comfortable in my classes, you probably are doing okay, even at a four-year university. That is from experience. All right, so that's basically what this module is. You know, I wrote it you know, just a few days ago because I thought, you know, maybe it's gonna be helpful to some people. Uh, this one, I'm not gonna go in. It talks about how to take notes. Um, by the time you get to this class, I'm fairly sure that the majority of people of this class already know, you know why you need to take notes and how to take notes. Okay, so I'm not going to focus too much on that one. Um, this one is about how to understand something that is really complex. Okay, so I'm just going to get in to give you an idea of what it looks like. An example of how to understand something, and actually I should say something really complex, I basically want to go through the same experience that you guys are going through taking my classes, but I cannot use you know, discrete structure or discrete math as an example because I know that stuff already. I, I'm not exercising my mind the same way that you would in this class. So I picked, I chose um, quantum computing because I had absolutely no exposure to quantum computing or the physics or the math that is needed to understand quantum computing. So that would give me um, a step up, which is about the same, probably more than the step up that you guys have to go through when you're taking this class. So that it forced me to go through the whole process of learning something that is new to me, that is challenging to me, something that I cannot just go like, oh yeah, I can just read this and pick it up. No, nope. not, not even close, okay? So the way you can read this document, if you so choose to, is not to read the rest of it and read just the boxes. Because the rest of it actually talk about quantum computing and all the math involved in quantum computing. So if you're not interested in quantum computing, you don't have to read the portion. But you might want to just read the boxes because the boxes talk about the approach that I took to understand the material in quantum computing, but without referencing anything that is technically in quantum computing. It is all about the, the technique, okay? So it might be helpful to some people, you know, you don't have to read this. This is definitely optional reading. So let's go back to the other modules. Um, starting this semester, I'm starting to move all my uh, material, which are, which are OER to begin with, to GitHub. So what that means is if you want to download a version of the material that I have prepared and do whatever you want with it, you can, okay? Legally, you can. The only thing you cannot do with that material is to sell it because the license says you know, NC, which is non-commercial. So as long as it is non-commercial, you can download this material and do whatever you want with it. So can someone give me some idea of what you might want to do with that note for this class? Yes? I've already gone back and used the note from 310 because um, I wanted to, I couldn't remember um, what was it? Oh, it was like the flag for the computer, yeah. which one is for uh, unsigned comparison, which one's for signed comparison. Mm -hmm. And I was building a computer in Minecraft, so I wanted to know. Uh, uh, <laughs> I couldn't remember which one was it, so I've already gone back and used it. Okay, cool. And building computers is actually a cool thing again, 
because you know there was a time when in the history of you know computer science and computer engineering the computer engineering is quote unquote a second class subject it's not that anymore so why what changed that There was a time when people want, everybody wants to go into computer science, CS, right? And those who cannot get into CS would go like, ah, oh, okay, fine, I'll, I'll get into computer engineering because you know, it's easier to get into. There, there are fewer people who want to get into computer engineering. But that trend is not true anymore. It has been reversed. So what reversed it? What event has reversed that trend? Is it quantum? Hmm? Is it quantum? Uh, not quite quantum, something that's even more closer to our current, you know, present moment. Yes? GPUs. GPUs, very good. AI, GPU, and so on. <clears throat> Has anyone read about you know, how much energy the AI industry as a whole is consuming? It's mind-boggling. Mind -boggling. Okay? You, you, you can look it up, okay? I'm not going to look it up, but you can look it up, okay? What, what is the shortages in the AI industry? GPU, the chip itself, and energy. It's not about, you know, do I have enough money to pay for the electrical bill? It is about, is there enough electricity available? You can have all the money in the world, unless you can build your own power plant, you may not be able to get enough energy for your AI company. Those two are physical limitations. And then on top, obviously, we need people you know, to work on those projects and so on. The amount of human input in the AI industry is also mind-boggling. You go like, but that's not, that, it doesn't make sense because it's artificial intelligence, right? It just come out of nowhere. This intelligence just pop up from nowhere. Where, where, where is this AI coming from? You go to ChatGPT and it, it seems so intelligent. Where is it coming from? People, yes. The current Gen AI is a very, very good imitator of what we do because you know, the training is all coming from people. They're content created and developed by people. So in order for AI not to become AS, artificial stupidity, what, what needs to happen? It, it needs to be trained, okay, but, but what do you, what material do you use to train AI? You have to filter it. It has to be filtered. Because otherwise, it will just learn everything, including all the stuff that it's, it would not use, be useful, it will learn those too. So it actually takes a lot of human power, a lot of you know, actual human labor in order to filter what material should be used to train AI. They don't talk about this, you know, um, some of that, it, it is expensive as well. So that's why some of those is done offshore, not in the United States, because it's less expensive somewhere else. All right. Um, this one here is about you know, the Maya Briggs type indicator personality assessment. It is helpful because I think it is always helpful to gain a better understanding of yourself. To be practical, one of the things that you can probably um, determined out of you know, your MBTI personality assessment is what is the best strategy for you to study. Some people like to study with you know, other people. In fact, they want to study with other people. Being able to be studying in a group energizes these people. I'm not one of those people. Okay, When I'm around people who want to talk a lot, I cannot hear my own thoughts, and that's a problem. So I cannot study with other people. So this, you know, the MBTI personality assessment or any type of personality assessment can actually help you to derive the best strategy for you to study and to succeed in college. And everybody is a little different, so what works for me may not work for you and vice versa. Okay, so this is something that is actually, most people think it is not useful, not practical. I think it is actually very practical and useful. All right, so there's that, and then now we move on to the syllabus, and there's a shared folder of all the important stuff. <clears throat> this class has uh, multiple prerequisite and one co-requisite. 
<coughs> CI uh, math 370 or 372 or pre-cal is the mathematics you know, pre, um, prerequisite to this class. Um, and then there's a co-requisite of CISP 430, which means you should be taking 430 in the same semester or you have taken 430 already. Um, I understand that FLC and I think Sac City, does not, they do not have the same requirement, but because this is an ARC class, we are playing by the ARC rules, okay? All right, so um, if you have at least one of these two homework, you know, quote unquote homework assignments, getting a zero out of one or a dash out of one, then you need to work on it, okay? You probably need to uh, sign up and show me that you're enrolled in the CISP 430 section. It doesn't have to be ARC. It can be at Boson Lake. It can be at any one of the four colleges or even out of the district, okay? If you find a college out of the district, they're offering data structure and you can get into that class. You can file a prerequisite requirement challenge petition and I can sign it off and go like, yep, it's really the same class. We're taking it in the same semester. We're good, okay? So if you're not getting one and one in these two assign, quote unquote assignments, you need to do something no later than Wednesday. Okay, the description of what you need to do is in the homework assignments themselves. All right, so we are now going to work on actual material. This is the whole reason of me not talking about the syllabus the entire time because I need all that time. Yes, go ahead. Um, is it okay to just upload uh, Yes. Yep, that'll work. Yep. Hmm? Show in person. Oh, like after this, like it just show you the half the class and everything, right? Uh, use the homework assign the homework interface. You know that that way, you know I don't have to. Yeah, it's it's better that way because that way I have a record. You know everything is good. All right, so we're going to go to Boolean operators, you know, because you know, I want to kind of ease into this class a little bit. And if you see GitHub in parentheses, it means you know, this is already in GitHub. I'm in the process of converting, so you know, some are and some are not. I will try to stay ahead a little bit. So what does it mean if it is already in GitHub, and why is it important? How many people have a, a chat GPT account and you're paying? 20 bucks a month you know, to get the 4 you know. Okay? All right, so can you can you think of some way to use your chat GPT, not to do your homework, but to actually help you learn the material in a class? I mean, uh, this is all speculation, but for example, if I have like an essay to write, mm -hmm. I don't write, I don't have the bot write the essay for me. It's a lot of the times, like sometimes if I get stumped on like a certain paragraph or I don't know how to word things, mm -hmm. I ask it to like word a paragraph for me. So just using it as like a reference to okay. improve instead of copying it down word for word, I feel like it helps with both learning and okay. like de stumps you. So I'm going to show you guys, you know, I'm going to use up a little bit of class time to show you what you can do with chat GPT 4.0 um, in the context of this class. So if you think about your grade as a value, like the Y value in a graph, I want to show you how to change the first or even the second derivative using your chat GPT. So use it as an accelerator, okay? All right, so I'm going to show you how to get to the source material. So at the bottom of all the you know, um, chat, not chat, uh, GitHub enabled or GitHub hosted content, there's the license, which describes you know, what you can and cannot do, mostly what you can. There's a little bit of what you cannot do with the content. This one will get you to the actual you know, GitHub, the source material. So this is the source material. It is written in Markdown, okay? If you don't know what Markdown is, it is useful to learn, okay? The learning curve is relatively shallow. It is much easier to learn compared to HTML or LaTeX or other ways of encoding um, text. So what you do is you do a control A, control C. Copy and you know, basically copy the entire content. And then you go to chat GPT. So we will go to chat GPT. I have an account already, so it signed, it signed me in automatically. So with the prompt, what you say is this is the material in my 
discrete structure class, I will be asking some questions about this later. So the idea of this prompt is you know, stop you know, chat GPT from giving you a summary and all the other stuff that it thinks is important because you're basically telling it, I will ask questions about this. I just want you to know what material we are talking about first. And then control V, it is a whole lot of stuff, but it's okay. All right. So now chat GPT said, uh, got it. Feel free to ask any questions about Boolean operators or anything else related to your discrete structure class whenever you're ready. They go like, I cannot think of a question. Oh, I can think of a lot of questions, okay? Because I was told that the way I write my material is particularly cryptic. Trust me, I did not try to make it cryptic. It just turns out to be cryptic to some people. So one thing you can do is, I just want a summary, okay? You can ask, then ask your chat GPT and go like, um, can you give me a summary of all the important points of this material? And here you go. It gives you a quick summary, and these are exactly what I talked about in this particular module keeps going and going and going, okay? And even, the, I think Claude does not do math equations as well as ChatGPT. ChatGPT is actually very good at one, understanding math equations, and two, generating answers that has math equations in it, okay? So it does give you a quick summary, okay? So you, if you find it difficult to dig through the way I write because of the way I write, this will give you a quick summary. There are plenty of people who keep saying, you know, because of my laziness, they will ask me, Tech, can you give me some questions and some you know, exercises so that I can practice all this stuff, okay? And genuinely, I cannot really think of a whole lot of ways to ask questions. Fortunately, ChatGPT can, okay? So now you can say, can you ask me a question? Um, so I can confirm my understanding of the material. Okay. okay, that's a question. I use a period. That's okay. Then you ask, then you can say, okay, question, given the Boolean expression x and y or not z, where x equal to 1, true, y equals to 0, false, and z equal to 1, what is the result of the conjunction? What is the result of the negation? What is the final result? Take your time to solve it and let me know your answers. So you work on this, right? You know, you go like, oh, okay. Um, in this case, you know, x is one, y is zero, so the conjunction is going to be a zero, false, right? And then on the other side, this is an or, and then on the other side, you have you know, the negation of z. Z is what? Z is false, but z is true, so it is false. You know, when you, when you look at the negation, it is false. So what do we have? We have false or false, which is false, okay? So if you explain all of that in this detail, ChatGPT will not only confirm that your answer is right, it will praise you. It will say, good job. You did a very good job you know, explaining, doing this step by step, and so on. What if you make a mistake? It will try to spot where the mistake is. In other words, if you got, if you got this part wrong, the conjunction wrong, from what I have tested, ChatGPT is actually capable of spotting that error, and it will go back and explain what a conjunction is. Okay? So what if you did not study at all? You look at this and, have, and say, I have no idea what those symbols are. Okay? Well, then ask ChatGPT. Then you can say, I did not study. What is the meaning? of one of these symbols. So you go like, okay, but how do I enter that symbol? You know, how do I know how to enter this thing here? I'll show you in my notes how to do that, but it is called a wedge, okay? Can you help, can you explain that? Okay. And ChatGPT comes back and say, yo, the symbol 
the wet symbol represents the AND operation in Boolean logic, also known as conjunction, and that's the term that I use in my notes, okay? So all of this is actually specific to the context that I uploaded earlier. And then it explains the AND operator takes two Boolean values, true or false, as input and produce a Boolean value as an output. The result of X and Y is true if only if, and it should have said if and only if, both X and Y are true, otherwise the result is false, and it will give you the truth table, which is also in my notes too. Okay, so are you guys starting to see how you know, chat GPT combined with the ODR nature of my content can be very helpful in your study? Are you good? All right. So this is good for studying. It is not going to be directly helpful in your exams. Because exam one, exam two, and the final exam, they're all in person, on paper, no electronics. So in that sense, ChatGPT is not going to be able to help you. But when you're trying to understand the material, you, I think it is a tremendous help. 4.0 is significantly better compared to 3.5 when it comes to logic. So, you know, it is uh, quite a advancement you know, in that sense. It takes files too. Yep, it will take a file. You can give it the link. You can say, you know, follow this link and you read that read that material so you don't have to copy and paste. Okay. All right. So you can interact with the content. So what if you gain some insight and go like, oh, so that's what you mean by blah, blah, blah. Okay, so you come up with your own explanation. How do you write down your notes? You can do it on a piece of paper, as usual, right? You can also use the source material. So I'm going to teach you guys how to do that too. So I'm going back to this link here. Make sure that I copy this again. Okay, control A, control C, copy it. And then what I'm going to do is I will use a program called um, Joplin. I need to change this. I'll move my uh, window into your view in just a moment here. Okay. So this is Joplin. And Joplin is um, a markdown editor. It is kind of what you see is what you get, you know, kind of editor. So one thing you can do is to say, I am going to create a new notebook, okay? And uh, you can, I can hide you know, this part here. So now I... I use uh, the VI key binding you know, because I'm a VI person. So control V. And now you can see you know, all the content you know, already rendered on the other side. You go like, okay, but that's not new. I can just go to the website. That is true, but that means you know, this means you can now put your notes here. So you can basically say, okay, you, if you want to highlight your stuff and use a different color, you can say division style is, I want the color to be purple. I think this will work. I'm not a HTML person, but we'll see. It's, it's working already. So now you can use this template and say, you know, oh, so equivalence is like a double-sided implication. Okay, which is true. Okay, I'm just using this as an example of once you have the source material. And you know, something like Joplin or even GitHub itself, okay? You can interweave your own notes within my stuff. And you can use colors, you can use a box. There are many ways to highlight your own content interspace or interleave you know, with mine. In other words, this is another way you can use to take notes, okay? You get the material first. The first time you go through the material, use this method to ask questions. It's like, I'm not quite really sure what this means, okay? So that in class, when I get to that point, you can ask the questions. But after the class, when you're reviewing all the material, you can also refine you know, my writing. You go like, oh, tech, that's a terrible way of explaining this concept. I'm going to change the paragraph to a much better way, my way of explaining it. You can do so, okay? So I think this is a way, okay, I cannot say whether it's a better or worse way, you know, for taking notes and you know, studying the material, but at your level, okay, you haven't taken a few programming classes, you know, 
um, hopefully more comfortable with tools like this and also learning Markdown, this is an option. Okay, it gives you some additional possibilities of how to take notes, how to get to the material, how to interact with the material so that you can go like, I'm not really sure I understand this. Can you, you know, chat GPT, ask me a question about this and, and evaluate my answer to that question? So are we good so far? How much is chat GPT? Do I have enough money to do that? How much is it? 20 bucks a month. Okay, I know it's not free. Okay, I understand 20 bucks is 20 bucks, but it is not too prohibitive. Okay, considering this class has no textbook, how much do you pay for quote unquote text material that is proprietary that you have to buy from a publisher from your other classes? 60, 60 okay. Okay, so this one, you know, you if you subscribe it for four months, that's 80 bucks. So that's not out of line, I think, you know, from, you know, what you normally have to spend in terms of your textbook material. All right, so do we have any questions about all this stuff? None of this is actually the class material that I want to talk about today, but I want to kind of introduce, you know, all of these available ways for you to interact with the material. Any questions? Okay, so I hope you guys see the possibility of, um, you know, kind of learning in a different way for this class here because the material is available in this particular format. All right, so what I'll do now is I will go back and actually explain the Boolean operators. So this is going to go really fast because most of the operators you know already. There are only two operators that are new, so we'll go over those two more slowly. But everything else is like, eh, we'll kind of quickly kind of blaze through those mat that material. The first one is conjunction. And by the way, if you hover over, you know, a heading, it gives you a little link symbol. So that means if you right click and you say, say copy link, you can link to a specific section of this material, which makes it a little bit easier to organize your own material. Because if you just say, I want to refer back to text, your paragraph, but only one particular section, this gives you a way to refer back to just one section. So you don't have to read the entire thing to find you know, that one section. All right, so this is conjunction, which is you know, what we normally know as AND, A-N-D, and this is the truth table. So the way you read the truth table is every row is telling you, in this case, if X is false, Y is false, then X and Y is false. This is the symbol for conjunction in mathematics. So do we have any questions about the truth table? How to read it? Nope. Okay. So if you're one of those people who say, okay, I want to learn how to enter the mathematical symbol, just like you know, in my notes here, this is easy. Right click on the math stuff here. Okay. Oh, so this one is not working. I don't know exactly why. Let's try this one. Yep. So right click on the equation, go to show math as, and then use your tech command. So this will tell you exactly how to enter X and then the inverted V symbol Y. This is also useful in Canvas. Okay, so if you're taking some other classes and your professor asks, okay, I want you guys to give me the equations, the formula, you know, in Canvas, in the Canvas you know, editor, it's the same way. You can actually type all that stuff in instead of using the interactive you know, editor, which I think takes longer. All right, and then there's a little discussion of the notations in C++ or anything that's derived from C, ampersand, ampersand is representing the same operator in mathematics. You know, that's, we talked about this already. But a lot of times, if you're in computer engineering, it is simplified to just a multiplication. It looks like multiplication, but it really is a Boolean operator. But because it is multiplication, oftentimes people even don't even use the dot, okay? They just use x, y to represent this as x and y. All right, so do we have any questions about the notation of conjunction or the meaning of conjunction? Yes? Can you show us again how you see the um, two sets of lines? Yes, so it is, you go to the uh, formula, right click on it, 
and then click on show map as, and then you go to text command. So that way it will show you what we call the LaTeX, you know, format, you know, to represent the equation. Um, it is a fairly common um, notation for equations for math stuff and even for chemistry stuff. Um, so once you learn how to do this, you know, it is actually useful for many of your classes, not just computer science, but also you know, the other math classes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. No other questions. Then we move on to OR, which is, you know, the fancy name of OR is disjunction. So, you know, kind of the same thing. I have a truth table. So the only time you get a result of false is when you have zero or zero or false or false. And then for all three, all the other three possible cases, you have true as the result of disjunction. So that's the truth table. And then here we talk about the notations uh, in C, C++ and all the programming languages derived from C. Um, the double bar is representing your know, disjunction. In mathematics, it looks like a V, but it is not a V symbol. And for those of you who are curious, it's like, how do we call this a symbol in LaTeX? Well, it is called just D, okay, D, E, E. Um, in computer engineering, it is, people often use the plus sign to basically overload, okay? They overload the plus operator. So instead of doing arithmetic addition, it means the same thing as disjunction. So why do you think computer engineers would use multiplication to represent conjunction and use the plus symbol to represent disjunction? One times zero is zero for A, and then mm -hmm. only make it one, six, one time for A. So it, it seems to have some resemblance, right? And then two is, you know, it's much easier to type the plus symbol on the keyboard than to use backslash V E E to represent the V symbol, right? So, you know, from the notation perspective, it's easier to just to use borrow the operator plus, but, you know, from the perspective of the properties of this kind of you know, operator, there's also resemblance. Um, if you are moving on to a math and computer science program, you will have to take, you know, abstract algebra so in abstract algebra, they will also define these operators, you know, plus addition, multiplication, and so on and so forth. But none of that is actually doing what we know as addition or multiplication. Okay, so that's a different kind of study. Um, it's a more on the math side, and we are not even going to touch that in this class. Okay. And now we move on, move on to negation. Negation is simply the word not in English. It flips the result. Um, so you know, if x is false, then not x is true. If x is true, then not x is false. So no big deal about this one. The notation is the exclamation point in C, C++. In mathematics, you know, this is the cliff symbol. Some people, some people call it the cliff. So once again, if you want to know the LaTeX or the tech representation, it is backslash NEG for negation. In engineering, this is where it goes a little bit interesting, because in electrical engineering and also in computer uh, engineering, um, they sometimes they use an over bar to mean negation, uh, but that's still really hard to type. Okay, you know, you can't do it; it's a little hard. So when you look at people who just want to use the regular keyboard to type, you know, the name of a signal on the chip, they use slash. So when you see a symbol in on a chip. Um, Description, if it's a slash, it often means you know, the negation of whatever it is. All right, so are we good so far with all the material? Yes. Um, it's a mix. So by the time we get to parts where you have to use the notation, I use x, y to mean x and y, x plus y to mean x or y. But instead of using a slash, which can be confused with division or over bar, which is really difficult to type. I just use exclamation point to mean negation. So that's, so we will get to that part where, you know, I will tell you guys you know, what notation I prefer you guys to use. All right, but at this point, you know, all you need is to find out, you know, you know what symbols are equivalent, right? 
All right, so I'm going to pause a little bit to see if there are any questions about the three logical operators that are defined in C and C++ and all the other programming languages that we know of. Do we have any questions about those three operators? Okay, very good. We can move on then. Oh, there was a question? Okay. <laughs> so now we move on to some kind of awkward operators. Uh, NAND is, I just throw NAND in here just for fun, okay? So NAND is basically, okay, so if the up arrow is the NAND operator, X NAND Y is really just the negation of X and Y. NAND, the first N, stands for negated. In other words, NAND is really just a quick way to say negated N. Is that part okay? So you ask, why, why do we even bother to talk about NAND, okay? It is not one of those operators that we learned from CISP 360 or 400 or 430. Um, it is not, it, it, it's not equivalent to a word that we normally use in English. So why bother with this, you know, operator? Well, because it's a, it, it's, a, it's a universal operator. Using just NAND itself, and you can nest it in different ways, I can give you the regular, the normal negation. I can give you the normal conjunction and I can give you the normal disjunction or. And all just using different ways of connecting you know, or structuring the NAND expression. You guys go like, I don't believe that. That is just a whole lot of hocus pocus, right? Well, you can do it yourself, okay? So I claim, this is my claim, I claim that X and Y can be expressed as X NAND Y, the whole thing NAND, X NAND Y. You guys go like, well, tech, you can claim whatever you want. No, I cannot claim whatever I want. There are ways for you to say, tech, I check this and you're wrong, or you're right. So how do you check it? A truth table, very good. So you can make a truth table just you know, to evaluate it. To make a truth table, you have x and y as independent variables, and then you evaluate x and y, which is easy because I've got it done already. And then you have another column just to evaluate x nand y nand x nand y. And then you go like, but we are not familiar with the concept of nand, so you know, what are we going to do about that? Well, convert it into the negation of an and. Every time you see the up arrow, convert it into the negation of the and between the two sides of whatever you are nanding. Is that okay? What does it look like? It's not going to be very nice, look, good looking. Okay, this is going to look ugly. But just because it's ugly does not mean it's not doable. So I say that I would say that you should probably do it at least once. Okay, so I'm claiming that we have. Uh, X NAND Y. Okay, I'm using NAND here because this is just a text editor. I cannot use the up arrow. So no NAND X NAND NAND Y. Okay, so it is equivalent to what? Let's convert everything into X and Y. Okay, so now what do I put on one side? Well, X NAND Y itself, right? So this is an X and y negated and same thing on the other side copy and paste are we good so far so now what you do okay this is a good exercise for you guys to do is to come up with a truth table with that really long expression that you know how to evaluate already this particular one so the result of this should be the same as regular and. and that is something that you can verify. Are we good so far? All right, so I'm hoping at least a few people are jotting down, you know, okay, we should try, I should try this myself with a truth table. Because listening to me to talk about this and go like, oh yeah, you can do this with, with truth table is different from actually doing it with a truth table. We already know what the truth table is going to look like. 
That is not the point. The point is for you to actually do it once or twice, okay, so that you're used to the concept, so that you're used to, oh, so truth tables are actually pretty useful, okay? So that's what I would recommend, okay? And so we can also do or. So in the case of or, x or y is x nand x nand y nand y. <laughs> but I claim that that is going to give you exactly the same result as x or y. Okay, you look at this and go like, if this is the first time you get exposed to this, you go like, uh, it's not straightforward. It is not straightforward, okay? But using a truth table, you can actually evaluate these expressions and show yourself it's like, oh, okay, it does work, okay? So I'm introducing NAND as an operator. It is one of these operators, it's one of those operators that we are not gonna use for the rest of this entire semester. But I want to introduce it because it is one of the most important operators along with NOR, which you probably know what it is, negated OR. It's one of the most important two operators in computer engineering. Because these two gates are the easiest to construct out of transistors. Okay. Has anyone heard of uh, the term FPGA? It stands for, yes, go ahead. Yes, field programmable gate array. I mean, there's a bunch of words that each individual one we understand, but together, what does it mean? Uh, it's, it's, it's an array of, I mean, they're really lookup tables, but they are meant to be programmable logic gates. Yes. You can program after they've been manufactured. Yes. So it's basically a RAM-based network of logic gates. Okay. In other words, Samsung can go like, Okay, we are pushing for you know the S25 release date, um, and one of these things you know that they need to do like the optimization of voice, your know, transmission and whatnot. Okay, frequency and analysis and whatnot. Uh, we don't have enough time to finish it you know, before we release the phone or the one that we are releasing is kind of clunky. Okay, it, it takes a lot, it takes more energy than we would like it to, but they're gonna release the hardware anyway. So FPGA allows you know, the programming of the logic network or the circuit to be altered after the phone is released. It is just, quote unquote, an update that Samsung can send you know, over, the, over the air to all of the devices. And because NAND and NOR are the most, the simplest logic gate out of your using transistors, so basically an FPGA or you know, similar devices can be seen as a gigantic array of NAND gates. What you can control is the interconnection between the NAND gates. So that means, oh, okay, we have a, something that's really complex to express. As long as you can translate all of those, you know, compile, compile that all the way down to NAND gates, you can do it with the FPGA. So these days, you know, a lot of the AI-related calculations is also like this. Okay, you know they are all they fall they fall into the same category of you know we need some specialized logic to perform some specialized you know, calculation, but we may not have the best way to do it right now. There may be a more optimized way to do it. Well, release the product anyway. When we find a better way to do it, we'll update. So FPGA allows manufacturers to do this. FPGAs used to be like super duper expensive. It is insane to put it into any consumer product, they are now so inexpensive that every cell phone probably has at least one or more FPGA devices just so that some specialized you know, function can be reprogrammed later on so it is, it's more optimal. All right, my, my watch just buzzed, which means you know, it's time to take a roll. So the way I take roll in my classes is to give you some kind of activity to do. So you know, I'm not arranged yet, but you guys can use this time to sign in using your cell phone to your Canvas shell. So by the time you, you're done with that, hopefully I have the activity also done. So go ahead and sign in first. And then I will make the activity available at that point. I'm just recycling you know, all the role taking activity from last year. 
If you do not have a mobile device that you can sign into Canvas with, you can just write your name on a piece of paper and they give me that piece of paper at the end of the class. That will work as well. But I personally prefer to do everything you know, online just because it's kind of easier that way. All right. So let me give you guys up to 15 minutes to do it. So do it. So, okay, let me see if I can just specify the time and see if it knows you know, that it's going to be today. Ah, no. I hate Canvas with a passion. It is so stupid. wants me to type everything. It doesn't take 24 hour format either, which is lame. And if I don't leave a space between the time and PM, it won't recognize it either. So broken. All right, and I will save and publish. So the access code is implication. I'll write it on the whiteboard just so that people can still see it. Implication is the access code. So go ahead and refresh your browser and see if you can see the load taking activity with today's date on it. 20240826. Is that okay? You can see some knots. Okay, excellent. And you have 15 minutes to do it. You can actually go to the bathroom, come back, and still have some time. and the normal circumstances. So I'm gonna wait until most people confirm that they have done it. Okay, some, some of you are putting your phone away so I know you're done. <clears throat> You are done with this, all right. So I'm gonna go back to the notes here and continue with the next operator. The next operator is called implication, hence you know, the you know, access code being implication. So if we cannot call it just implies it as a verb or call it implication as a noun. You go like, Im implication is, is an operator, it's a logical operator. Well, I can define anything to be a Boolean operator, okay? As long as I give you the truth table, it is an operator, okay? So in this case, the symbol for implication is, in this class, it's a double bar and a right arrow, okay? And this is a truth table. So look at the truth table go like, look like or to me. Well, it is related to or, but it's not entirely just or, right? Because if this were or, then the first row would have been a zero, the third row would have been a one, you know, as far as the result of the operator is concerned. But this one is not, right? It's a little awkward, it's a little off. It's like zero implies zero, or false implies false is true. Hmm. That is kind of awkward, right? And then the only time you can get an implication itself to be false is you have true implies false. That's the only time an implication itself is false. So you go like, I cannot make sense out of this. Okay, this does not make sense. It does not compute. So I'm going to give you an example. Okay, so this is an example. And it's absurd. Okay, the statement itself is absurd. Okay, for a reason. So let's just say that, you know, I tell you guys, give Give me 50 bucks, I'll give you some worthless Bitcoin. Okay, so go ahead. You take PayPal, okay, so you PayPal me 50 bucks, and I told you just that. Okay, blue cat is sick, implies tomorrow is being stuck. You go like, is that it? I spent 50 bucks to buy that one statement? I go like, yup. Those 50 bucks is, is now in my pocket. They go like, I'm a, I want my money back. I go like, well, if you can prove me wrong, I'll give you your 50 bucks back. Is that okay? Does everybody understand the scenario? Obviously, you want your 50 bucks back. But then you have to prove me wrong, okay? 
So now let's take a look at the four possible scenarios. So, um, so we have to refer to yesterday, okay? So yesterday you saw a blue cat being sick, okay? And tomorrow turns out to be doomsday. Everything falls apart. So the question is, can you get your money back? Not that you really care about the 50 bucks now that today is doomsday, but no, you cannot get your money back. Does that make sense? This one is obvious, right? You know, because what I said would happen did happen. Okay, you saw a blue cat the day before, and then the following day turns out to be doomsday. Okay, let's move on to the second case. So today is not doomsday. Everything is normal as usual. You did not see a blue cat being sick either yesterday. So the question is, can you get your money back? Is your experience today conflicting with what I told you for 50 bucks? The answer is no, it does not conflict because I didn't say anything about what if you do not see a blue sick cat. Anything can happen, okay? Because my statement has absolutely nothing to do with what happens when you do not see a blue and sick cat. Is that okay? Let's move on to the third possible scenario. Yesterday, you did not see a sick and blue cat, but today somehow is doomsday. Can you get your money back? The answer is no, because just like what I said earlier, my statement does not say anything about what if you do not see a blue and sick cat. So anything can happen. Today can be doomsday, may not be doomsday, maybe half doomsday, doesn't matter. You cannot get your money back. So the only time you can get your money back, which is basically saying what I told you is false, is the last case. You saw a cat yesterday, a, a blue cat that is sick. You saw that yesterday, and today everything is normal. Okay, Then you can get your money back. But because today is just a normal day, you can also take that $50 and go to Starbucks and go like, I'm just going to spend a few bucks on Starbucks coffee or cha or whatever. Does that make sense? Okay, so the important part of this is the implication, the statement that I gave you right here, a blue cat is sick implies tomorrow is doomsday, is by itself a statement. It by itself can be true or false. That is the most important part of this entire discussion. This implication itself gives you a Boolean value. The implication itself can be true, it can also be false. Are we okay with that? So for those of you who you know, kind of intrinsically understand the semantic of implication, great. For those of you who go like, oh, that all sounds kind of confusing, that's okay. Just remember the two cases. So mechanically, this is how implication is defined. Is that okay? Or do both if you want to do both. Are we good so far with implication? So you think about implication, you go like, uh, I don't remember the last time in CISP 360, 400, or 430 that I actually have to use the implication operator. You'll be correct. There's no such operator in C, C++, or any programming language that I am aware of. On the other hand, if you have taken, you must have taken some math classes because CISP 375 is a prerequisite to this class. Every time you're asked to prove a theorem, you are using implication. Because a proof in mathematics is nothing more than a long chain, or if you want to call it a mash, of implications. You start with something that is true to begin with, and then this mash of implication will result in a particular statement being also true you know, after the entire chain or mash of implication. So in this class, implication is significant and also useful in many discussions that we'll be talking about later on. Okay, so implication is important. Okay, you might want to highlight it in your notes. Then we move on to the last operator, which is known as equivalence, or if and only if, okay, so it is also known as if and only if, 
So in this case, we have uh, the truth table looks like this. So basically, it is the same as equal to, okay, but in a Boolean sense. So false, if and only if false is true. False, if and only if true is false. True, if and only if false is false. True, if and only if true is also true. So it's kind of like a equality, but it's not exactly equality, but if you want to look at it as equality, yeah, that's okay. One way to look at if and only if or equivalence is, you know, x if and only if y is basically exactly the same thing as x implies y and y implies x. And you can use this to, in the truth table, to show that, oh, I'm getting the same you know, value as here. I forgot one more thing, okay, when we talked about implication. So not x or y is also exactly the same as x implies y. In other words, if you are to make a truth table for not x, the whole thing, or y, it would have given you exactly the same result as the truth table of implication. I just made a claim. What are you going to do? You want to kind of jot down some notes and go like, okay, tech may be lying, need to verify, okay? But how are you going to verify that? Truth table, exactly, because as long as you know how to evaluate not negation and or, you can double check and make sure that not x or y indeed will give you exactly the same truth table as what I required here. That is what you can do, and that's what you should do at least once or twice, okay, just so that you know what a truth table is and why it is useful. Are we good so far? Okay, I know, you know, a lot of professors will complain and not like me saying this. The best way to take a class is to imagine your professor is trying to trick you and tell you something that is not true the entire time. It is up to you to question everything and prove that the professor is indeed talking and giving you something that is true. Because that will force you to basically make all the connections that are necessary to basically go like, okay, wait, okay, tax said blah, 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 okay? Not X or Y is really the same thing. X, X implies Y. I'm not buying it. I'm going to have to prove it myself. So the first thing that, the first exercise is, how am I going to prove that? Okay, do I have enough tools to prove it? You go like, oh, there's something called a truth table. Okay, uh, do I know how to evaluate the negation of X or Y? Yes, I know how to do that. Oh, so that means I can use a truth table to show that you know if I evaluate the expression not X or Y, I should end up with exactly the same values as here. Then you go actually do it, okay, and show to yourself that these two things are exactly the same. So what is the value of doing all that stuff, even though you know your professor really is not trying to deceive you and tell you something that is not true? What is the value of doing this? Yep. If you do it, on, especially if you write it down, okay? There are some studies that shows that if people start write write things down, they retain that information better than typing. There are a few reasons. I talked to um, some English people. They basically say that you, know, you cannot possibly hand write as fast as you can type. And even that is a little bit slower than the speed that you can think. So when you are handwriting something, you are forcing your brain to go like, okay, can I make this more succinct? Can I simplify this? Can I use the least number of words to describe my con the concept that I have in my mind? All of that is an exercise. It's building additional pathways in your brain to connect con to, to make that connection between concepts. What is understanding, by the way? If I say, do you understand this concept? What, what does that really mean? Okay, I'll, I'll give you a few options. You guys can, can turn your heads or nod your heads, okay? One, if I give you a certain concept, it means you understand every single word in the statement. Is that understanding a concept? Nope. So what exactly is understanding a concept?
Okay. Go ahead. How they relate to each other. How they relate to each other and everything else that you have learned so far. So you try to push it as far as you can. It is about the connection, the relationship between concepts. This is a new concept. Um, I understand every single word of this statement, but I don't know how it connects to all the things that I have learned so far. That means you have not understood the concept. If you look at the statement, you go like, oh, okay. So that means this relates to this, and this relates to this, and this relates to this, and you're building this huge mesh of concept and how they interconnect, then you're probably understanding the concept. So it's about the connection. Writing and listening exercise different pathways in your head. So when I'm talking, this, is, this happens to me a lot, okay? Which is not saying good things about me, but I'm gonna let you guys know anyway. A lot of times students will tell me, when you talk about this, when you're doing this on the whiteboard, I understand it, I get it. And when it's my turn to do it, I have no idea how to do it, okay? Because listening to something exercises one type of pathways in your, in your mind, but when you're actually actively trying to do something, trying to solve a problem, writing it down, all of those would exercise different pathways in your brain. And more pathways means you have more connections between the concepts, which also means when it's time to apply the concepts, it's easier for your brain to retrieve, oh, so I'm reminded of this thing here. What else is related? Your mind goes like, oh, okay, all of these things here, and then it expands and expands and expands. So, th so that's why it is important to take notes because it, it's forcing your mind, your brain, to establish these pathways. Not related to the main content of this class, uh, there is a book or a website that talks about how taking notes is like having a second brain. It's called building a second brain. You know, it's about note taking using modern high technology. So they, they made a whole website and make a lot of money. They sell the books, they have courses and whatnot. But the bottom line has to do with taking notes. Your mind cannot possibly remember and maintain everything that you need to access. So your notes is basically your peripheral brain so that you can go to your notes and go like, okay, I can't quite remember what that thing, how that thing is defined. You flip through your notes and then you can remember that. All the tests, all the exams in this class are open book and open notes. So first of all, I know people like to evaluate and judge things. So is it a good thing or a bad thing? It's neither a good thing nor a bad thing, okay? I'm simply telling you that it is open book and open notes. So what do you do with that piece of information? Take good notes. Take good notes. It also means one thing, because I have been asked by many people right before the exam and say, Tag, can you give us a study guide you know, for this exam? I go like, I cannot possibly give you a study guide. Because the study guide is something that you need to create. Well, I only got like 24 hours. I cannot possibly make the study guide in 24 hours. Because you should be making a study guide all along. Okay, taking notes is the first step. And then when you condense your notes into something, it's like, okay, I don't need all of these words. I don't need all of tax words around. I need, this is my way of organizing all the information. Okay, that is you maintaining and making your study guide the entire time. So keep that in mind, okay, because you, know, you are allowed to bring anything you want that is as long as it is either handwritten or printed prior to the exam. So you can go to the internet, you can ask your know, chat GBT, you can have all kinds of material you know, that you can research, okay? The question is, how do you, what is the best way to look up that information? Now, I cannot answer that question for you. Some people are more graphical, they like mind maps, right? Some people are more text oriented, they just need the equations and just kind of maybe draw a few arrows between the equations. Some people are more word oriented, they need words to explain those things. So they would jot down you know, short sentences. Whatever works for you, 
is how you want to prepare your own study guide. You can even look online, okay? You go ask your chat GPT, what is the best way to prepare study guide for an exam? You can even, okay, this is something I would do for you just to illustrate what is possible with chat and GPT. And this is going to conclude our lecture today, but I will give you your, your reading assignment just so that your people would be ready for the next class. Um, can you, okay, there are two things. Okay, so the first one is if I were to take notes while reading this material, what would that would have looked like? In other words, okay, um, this is probably not important to you because you guys are all seasoned college students already, but for people who have no idea how to take notes or what it entails, this can be helpful because ChatGPT actually does a fairly good job, quote unquote, taking notes for the material that it is given. So this will give you an idea of, oh, so if I were to take notes based on the material that we just kind of go, went through today, this is what it should have looked at. So it can be helpful to people who are starting to, who are like, okay, I need to learn better techniques. I'm not sure what my notes should look like. This gives you some idea. You can also ask it for study guide, okay, if I were to simplify all this stuff you know, to a piece of paper or study guide, what would it look like? So ChatGPT or other types of you know, uh, Gen AI tools can be very helpful. Do you think it's only helpful for this class? Nope. If it's helpful for this class, it means you know, it will also work for your psychology classes, it will work for your history class, it will work for anything that is not even technically or logical like this class. So I would experiment with that kind of technology. I would continue to experiment and find out you know, what are the best ways to use it. So if I find something, I will share with the class. I know you still have to pay 20 bucks a month. I have not been able to find a free resource that is as good as the paid ones. I just could not find one yet. Um, but I think those 20 bucks per month is well spent because it's all, not only for one class. It, it can be used for a lot of things. All right, so I am going to let you guys a little bit early today. Um, oh, reading assignment, right, I almost forget. See, you know, that's ADHD kicking in. It's like, oh, let's just go. No, wait, we got some more stuff. Okay, so the next class is will be in the set theory, you know, module. We'll be going through basic set theory but you, if you have time, okay, you can also go through basic quantifiers, okay? So this one has not been converted into GitHub yet, but uh, ChatGPT can actually be, it can understand HTML. You can just give it a link and go like, okay, read this note over there, and then you'll ask questions in ChatGPT. So I would try to just you know, kind of experiment with all of that stuff, you know, just so that you know what the tools can and cannot do. All right, so I'm done, okay? I'll see you guys on Wednesday. So on Wednesday, we'll start with all this material. And don't forget about the prerequisite and the co-requisite requirement. So if you do not meet all of the requirements, talk to me and then we'll try to figure out what to do. All right, I'll see all of you on Wednesday. Have a good day. Yep, you do. Oh, I'm recording the lecture too, so I'll upload that to YouTube as usual and give you guys the link to it.